We have a situation where the discussion about fiscal policy is more about how aggressive should it be, what exact composition should it uh, entail, rather than, okay, should we have fiscal austerity? There's not a lot of people advocating for uh, fiscal austerity now, certainly not people who have an have important voice. So this is like a big paradigm shift. My name is Jens Nordvik. Um, I currently run a company called Exante Data that I founded in 2016. And we do data-driven analysis. You can call it economic analysis or capital flow analysis. There's different aspects over the last year. Essentially since uh, January 20, we've done daily COVID forecasting as well. <laughs> and that's something we did uh, and planned to do, but we had to do that because that was the one thing that was moving the economy and markets. Uh, so in general, we try to have a data-driven approach to what we do. But uh, we're not machines, so in the team we also have humans, and uh, when you interpret data, uh, the human judgment can be very important. And we see that all the time, that if you assume there's some kind of linear relationship between what's going on with certain indicators and the economy and markets, you're going to be run over. There's going to be breaks in those relationships all the time. We had, a, we had a big shock that started in China. It was a big shock. And uh, the Chinese economy shut down. But for a period of time, financial markets assumed that it was going to be sort of an isolated Chinese shock and, and not really a global shock. And uh, it was actually pretty strange because we were tracking this very carefully and we could see, okay, now it's not Chinese anymore, it's happening in Iran, right? And, and, uh, and uh, then when it came to Italy and the, uh, and, the, and the Italian economy shut down, then I think it was clear to everybody this was going global. Uh, and then it didn't take long before it really took U.S. markets down, even, even before we had many cases recorded because we didn't do any testing pretty much. And, uh, and then March, obviously, was um, an epic move in terms of shutdown in the economy uh, starting and, and financial markets going into total freefall. And, uh, and then a lot of people started to think, okay, is this sort of another global financial crisis? And um, some things looked similar and some things looked totally different. Like uh, one of the things that people were concerned about is, oh, okay, the bank's going to be in trouble, right? That was sort of the epicenter of the 2008 uh, tension. And really, that there was really, really no bank-specific stress at any point in this cycle. And then the Fed stepped in, getting rates to zero, like just super, super quickly, and also starting to expand its balance sheet very, very aggressively at a pace we just haven't seen before, like buying bonds and, and other securities at, at, a, at a very, very aggressive pace. And not just that, also putting in place all these backstop facilities to uh, backstop credit broadly, high yield credit even, which was very controversial at the time, municipal bonds. So it was just like an alphabet soup of all these different facilities. Nobody could remember them because they came out so quickly. Uh, but it worked. And a lot of facilities weren't even very uh, used because they came so quickly that confidence didn't manage to deteriorate to a degree where huge amount of purchases were needed. Uh, and in the in the in the currency market, you also at at the height of the panic started to see very sort of uh, bizarre moves almost where like the safe haven currency, the Japanese yen started to weaken against the dollar. So it was like uh, some of that resembled 2008 where there was sort of dollar shortage, dollar hoarding that took place uh, for a short period of time. But the Fed also managed to fill those gaps with uh, swap lines. So really it was an, a remarkable shock that on, on many metrics looked like like literally one of the worst shocks we have seen. You, we call it a hundred year pandemic for a reason. Um, but also the Fed just stepped in and, and really managed to avoid uh, a negative sort of confidence spiral. And they managed to circumvent those mechanisms uh, much more effectively and much more quickly uh, than what was the case in 2008, 2009. Uh, and then uh, we, we started to see recovery in markets uh, and recovery in, in, in some types of economic activity later on. Uh, but really, financial markets really never looked back. Like, we've had some ups and downs, right? But really, th the notion that markets bottomed at some point in March 20-something and, 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 and then started to recover, it, it's been a, just an incredible ride since then. Not all markets have rallied at the same time, but uh, 
we got control of sort of the plumbing of the financial system. The treasury market calmed down quickly. Uh, the most important credit market started to calm down quickly. It took much longer for, for example, emerging markets to start to recover. And I would say, say the last sort of um, leg of, of this financial market recovery really started in November, where we started to get the, the positive vaccine news and, and people could start to really calculate, okay, if these vaccines are coming, like when are we going to actually have um, like the final descent in cases? I wouldn't say that we can say for sure we have that in, but people can say, okay, even if there's a the little extra wave as the new strains come into play, we know the vaccines with high probability are going to take care of that uh, by the spring. And that's what we really have, have started to, to see a big recovery in all kinds of growth sensitive assets including emerging markets. So I think what the last asset class that has really started to be impacted by this is emerging market growth assets, and we've seen those outperform. Not only are markets looking at the recovery and growth sensitive assets coming back to life, but we're also starting to anticipate that at some point there will actually have to be a policy response to take care of too strong growth. It sounds like almost bizarre that at this point in time where we have so much spare capacity, unemployment is still high. If you look at employment to population ratio, even more slack uh, uh, is evident on that type of measure. And nevertheless, uh, because the vaccine rollout is perceived to be so important and fiscal stimulus is really coming into to the equation, uh, the market is starting to look forward aggressively to uh, a cycle that's going to be much more aggressive down and up than really we've seen before and therefore necessitating some adjustment in interest rates over a period of time. It, it's a pretty pretty incredible setup. This is another thing that's, that's very different about this cycle compared to, to previous cycles. Uh, the Fed has communicated they, they essentially want a degree of inflation overshoot, right? So it's been common around the world uh, for the last couple of decades to have explicit or implicit inflation targeting, and, and almost all central banks set essentially 2% as the target. And now the Fed ha has communicated they want to have some idea of average inflation target, meaning that if we've been, low f been below 2% for a period of time, we are okay with overshooting. And, and the, the reason why the Fed went down in, in that um, path uh, when it was announced in the autumn was that they wanted to reduce the risk of, of being trapped at, at the lower bound, whatever that is, zero or something uh, slightly different from that. And they wanted to uh, essentially have a forward guidance that was more powerful. Uh, so this is potentially very important to the inflation outlook. Like if we know the Fed is not going to be preemptive, if they know they want to uh, have slightly above 2% inflation, that's important. And the other thing that's important about their framework is how they've announced that it's going to be implemented. So they've announced that it's going to be implemented in a way where they are only going to react once realized inflation has been above 2% and, and perhaps with some additional market margin above 2% for a period of time. And the reason why this is important, it sounds like a kind of technicality, but if you think about how we've been coming out of previous cycles, it's always been the case that once the economy started to look a bit better, you had a, a certain group within the FMC that was more hawkish than others. They started to say, oh, now we need to be preemptive uh, and we need to uh, sort of uh, uh, make sure we don't act too late. That debate is essentially pushed back now. It's, it's, it's in the background in the sense that They've agreed on a framework where it's not so much the individual FOMC members' forecasts that are important. It is what we actually realize. And that means that the liftoff in terms of rates, tapering is a slightly different issue, but the liftoff in terms of rates should be later. And uh, this, uh, I think you can all already see it in the yield curve that uh, the very short end of the yield curve is perceived to be very well anchored and it has been very well anchored, and uh, all the action is in the longer end. And just theoretically speaking, obviously, the, if the Fed is, is not preemptive, in a way we should have bigger moves in the long end, and that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, we should not forget that this is not only about the Fed, right? So this cycle, 
as I said already a couple of times, we only had a couple of minutes here, but I said a couple of times, but I'll say it a few more times probably. Like this cycle is really pretty extraordinary. There's the nature of the shock, there's what the Fed is doing, but uh, perhaps the most extraordinary piece is the fiscal piece. We're adding up these numbers. These are just incredible numbers, well above $4 trillion, above 20% of GDP. Um, if we go back to 2009, when there was an extraordinary need for, for stimulus, uh, the economy and financial markets were in tatters, now what we're looking at is something that is three times that. Uh, so, so the amount of stimulus is extraordinary. And you can listen to uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen now when she talks about, okay, when are we going to go back to full employment or at least unemployment that uh, was similar to what we had before this shock. We're talking about it sometime in 2020. So within a relatively short period of time, one year from now, uh, there's an expectation amongst policymakers that we can get back to uh, essentially having eliminated that spare capacity in, in, in the labor market. It's just an extraordinary situation. And I think uh, when you, you think about the inflation outlook, that's something we haven't tried before. Uh, there's a couple of other things we haven't tried before. We've never seen a situation where the service sector, a big part of the service sector, is essentially shut down. What's going to happen when it opens up? Like, what kind of capacity does that sector have? Uh, that's, that's just a big unknown. The, another big unknown is that all the fiscal transfers to households and businesses that have occurred have been of a size where a lot of um, consumers essentially were not able or willing to spend that uh, cash transfer. We have massive uh, savings, uh, and we, we tend to call it... Um, excess savings because it's really like beyond what is normal. Uh, depends a bit on how you measure it, uh, but at least one and a half trillion dollars uh, are sitting in very liquid uh, type of instruments that can really be deployed once feels like, uh, yeah, okay, you can go out and consume the things you actually want to consume because those sectors have reopened. So like how strong is demand going to be once you have reopening? It's like a function of the new stimulus that's coming, but it's also a function of this excess savings that has been accumulated already. And there's just really no precedent for this. Uh, and then there's the, the, the issue of, okay, if the pressure, the extra demand is really in the services sector, how does inflation really work in that sector? It's a tricky thing. So maybe I'll, 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 I'll do a plea to your young scholars here, like, because... Like, if you try to think about, okay, what research has really been done on how, does, how do prices in the service sector really respond to demand? There's almost no research in this area. This is not something that has been attracting a lot of uh, attention in, in academic uh, fields. So I think there's really a need to, to look at that carefully. Like, what is the risk of inflation in the services sector? Clearly, there's potential for, like, some volatility in demand and, and a spike in demand that, that is unprecedented, how are prices going to respond to that? That's really important to the inflation outlook. Uh, I have some views, but like often when you form a forecast, you go and check, okay, what's the best academic work? It was pretty hard to find <laughs> the work where you say, okay, this is our best, best in class academic uh, work. Uh, so I think that's something that's really missing uh, from, from the research agenda here at this point. The sort of fiscal conservatism that has been a part of the narrative of economic policy making, IMF advice, the way the European Union is set up, and certainly debate in, in the US, Tea Party and so forth, that fiscal conservatism, whatever form it took, it's just radically diminished, diminished or, or eliminated uh, from the debate, right? So we have a situation where the discussion about fiscal policy is more about, okay, how aggressive should it be? What exact composition should it uh, entail? Rather than, okay, should we have fiscal austerity? There's not a lot of people advocating for uh, fiscal austerity now, certainly not people who have an have important voice. So this is like a big paradigm shift. And it's important to, to think about, okay, this shift that has taken place, is it just because the COVID shock is so big that there's sort of a new political reality around that? Or is it a more permanent shift? If you're going to forecast inflation, 
that political dimension, I think, is going to be really important, right? If we knew there's going to be fiscal stimulus that is going to be well beyond the COVID relief packages in the U.S. and Europe and so forth, that really would put demand on a different trajectory and, and uh, inflation potentially on a different trajectory. And maybe I'll just make an additional point on that, right? So we've been in a regime now for uh, at least a decade, but you can argue two decades, where monetary policy has been used aggressively, but we have very few examples where aggressive monetary policy was actually able to really generate a significant inflation impulse. We've had a lot of examples of, of essentially failure to generate a very significant inflation impulse, but not really very many examples, if any at all, where, okay, it worked. So why was that? Like that monetary policy that perhaps was very aggressive in Japan, for example, but also recently in Europe and in the US, it was mostly based on getting interest rates down to a very low level, whatever each central bank perceived as its lower bound, being at zero in Europe, slightly below zero, and then combined with a form of QE. But this QE that was done in many different places was a type of QE that uh, I think is important to, to sort of label. It was like an asset swap QE. So the central bank bought some assets, typically bonds, took those assets out of the market, injected central bank reserves. So there was this asset swap, right? But what happened to those reserves? Like what happened to, to that uh, extra liquidity that was generated? Did it really impact the economy, right? It was a financial transaction. And uh, the idea was, okay, now the banks are going to have more ability to lend and so forth. That's going to be second round effect. But it was not a very direct impact. What we are seeing in this cycle is a much closer coordination between monetary policy and fiscal policy. So you've, you've had a situation where the central bank has to generate the liquidity, but at the same time, you've also seen that uh, the fiscal authorities have literally transferred cash, uh, and you can argue that same cash that was generated from the central bank authorities to households, right? So it's not like in the end, if you sort of consolidate the fiscal uh, authority and the central bank, it is not just the asset swap anymore. It is the liquidity injection that also entails the transfer of that liquidity to actual entities in the real economy that can potentially spend it. This is just a huge difference, right? So if you're, if you're forecasting inflation and just looking at what the central banks are doing alone, you're really missing the most crucial part of the picture here. There's always a debate about whether the dollar's reserve currency status is uh, somehow in question, right? And um, uh, it, it, it typically takes, this is a debate we've had for decades, and clearly like it, the, the reserve currency status has not disappeared from one day to the other. But there are some things that are totally new. Uh, and the one aspect is what's going on in China. So uh, China, for the first time in 2020, and into 2021 as well, has been able to attract a significant amount of foreign capital into its local bond market. This just never happened before. Like the bond market used to be closed, then they opened up, were not very successful, but for various reasons, yield advantage, inclusion in, in global bond indices and so forth, that has now happened. Uh, literally 100, 100 billions of dollars have come into that market. So for the first time, actually, there's a reserve currency element of the Chinese bond market that you can argue is important. The Chinese currency is also starting to behave in a, in a way that uh, from a sort of correlation matrix perspective also makes it look like a reserve currency. It's very stable. It has an appreciating trend. And when there's risk aversion in the market, when something bad is happening, it really doesn't weaken. It's incredibly stable in that situation. So the Chinese currency is starting to have more attributes that, that uh, make it uh, feel more like a real competition to the dollar. And then there's also potentially a, a, a new piece coming into the equation, which is due to technology. So China is creating a, a digital currency. It's being tested actively around the country.
uh, it entails uh, essentially consumers having a wallet of a type that is a central bank wallet where the central bank can inject this liquidity direct into citizens' uh, holdings and they can spend out of that. Uh, this has uh, implications for how clearing is happening, how trades are settled, transactions are settled. And uh, China definitely wants to have a digital currency where potentially from a technological perspective, they can compete with the traditional sort of banking-based uh, settlement of dollars and euros that uh, we've known for decades, uh, but which is not blockchain-based and not uh, digital currency-based. So they might, because they're leading in that space, have an advantage in terms of essentially being the first to, to build a digital currency, and that could also create some advantages in terms of like attracting other countries around them to sort of use that as a more efficient way to settle trade. So that could be a part of the picture.